Good evening. I'm Billy Tesik, the president of uh, NEWIC Qatar, National Association of Women in Construction. I hope you and your families are well. On behalf of the NEWIC Qatar Foundation Board, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our partners and sponsors for joining us. Qatar University, Public Works Authority Ashkal, GHD, Parsons, GSONIC, ERGA, Turner & Townsend, Qatar Financial Center, Lean Construction Institute Qatar, LCI and TMF. Over the last two weeks, Rebecca Morris presented to us two sessions on Agile Leadership how to balance efficiency, inclusion and diversity, and how to lead with resilience in uncertainty. We have received excellent feedback on the previous sessions and would like to uh, thank Rebecca for sharing her experience and expertise on the subject. And to thank to our attendees for their attendance, their engagement and their feedback. Thank you. This evening, Rebecca will present to us the third of the, third of the three sessions on Agile Leadership with um, how to lead powerfully using observational intelligence, identifying patterns, interrupting behaviours and integrating expectations. So, um, and as I noted previously uh, on our sessions, there are just a few, few points that I would like to note before we start. The session uh, is being recorded and uh, will be available with a copy of the presentation slides next week. To receive your electronic attendance certificate, you are required to attend at least 90% of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them uh, in the chat box. We, we will have a Q&A session after the presentation and in the case we don't answer all of your questions, we will send the answers um, uh, with, with the slides and the recording next week. Uh, also, just to point out, we had a couple of questions, unanswered questions last week that um, uh, we haven't passed on to Rebecca, uh, only because we have privilege for her to answer that uh, in person and uh, all our attendees can benefit from it. Um, the webinar, including q and session, we expect to last for an hour and a half. We appreciate your full attention during this time and uh, please stay away from anything that may distract you. During webinar or uh, after the webinar, if you could please kindly put your feedback in the, use the chat box again uh, with the plus sign for positive feedback and a delta sign for any comments or any suggestions for us to improve uh, um, our, our webinars. Now we got to the most important part of the evening and uh, again before I hand it over to Rebecca um, and for the benefit of attendees who weren't with us for either both or one of the previous sessions I would like to introduce Rebecca to anybody who is new. Rebecca Morris is a culture and resilience leader. She is also known as a mindset mentor, speaker, facilitator, author, consultant and leadership coach. She founded Paradigm Shift in 2011 as she repeatedly saw corporate career leaders allowing chaos to reign rather than choosing effective change. She is passionate about ensuring organizations choose the right cultural model and this includes ensuring healthy, safe employees by using right mental health and well-being programs. She brings over 30 years of experience in New Zealand, Australia and the US markets and she has achieved a great sales success in the IT industry. CEO experience in the business coaching market and senior leadership experience across markets. Re Rebecca provides high passion, high energy and has exper experiential expertise in every client she works with. This has seen paradigm shift growing from strength to strength. Rebecca's unique approach shifts leaders as well as businesses. Whether she's in facilitation, coaching or consultancy role, she's able to expertly focus on the root cause of behavioral patterns. She gains a deeper understanding of why people operate over the top of these behaviors and sees the direct correlation of these results in the business arena. She is the founder of, of the annual MORE, 
Premier Leadership Summit, as she's passionate about solving the systemic issues currently in New Zealand around this topic. She believes that only when we create action at an individual, organizational and community level will this change. Rebecca's first book, Empower Me, The Magic is in Believing It's Possible, was released in January 2016 and is a book primarily based on mindset. This book follows her journey and how her experiences have shaped her life both professionally and personally. She believes you are what you think and your behaviours and thoughts condition the results you get in life. Her second book, Wonder Woman, What the Hell Happened, was released, I love the name, was released in June, which is a self-book to show women how to break through the glass ceiling. Her third book, Observational and Intelligence, Intelligence Leadership, is due out in September 2020. And again, we are privileged to sort of get the get the snippets and the sort of the idea of of uh, of what what is going to be published in the book and uh, and get a very good feel of of uh, what agile leadership and of observational intelligence entails, how it's practiced and um, and uh, how everybody can benefit of it. She has online master uh, your mindset programs that were released in April 2020. Rebecca, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, welcome. Good evening. Um, so as Billy said, this is um, Agile Leadership um, number three out of three. So um, I'm just going to put this on. Billy, are we all good? Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Excellent. Okay. So oh, the fantastic piece, this is what I love the most. So we are talking today about patterns. We're talking today about observational intelligence. And we're talking about how do we actually use um, and understand and interpret behaviours, um, observational intelligence and manage expectations. So uh, last year, or actually the last couple of years, I've been doing some, some research and when I've been working with my clients, um, it helped me come up with um, this wonderful thing around um, called observational intelligence. And actually it's something that um, if you actually look it up, it, it's not around um, and it's my framework that I've put together. So it's my platform in terms of some of the gaps I saw at a leadership level in organisations across markets is how do, I mean, we talk about emotional intelligence, we talk about intuitive intelligence. Um, there's this big debate around EQ, hard skills, soft skills. And observational intelligence is, is something that I feel is becoming more and more important as um, leaders grapple with external influences, e.g. such as COVID-19 and whatever is going to come past that. And, um, and how do we actually get our leaders to become more observationally aware? And I'm going to take you through that today. Um, behaviours are a big thing, a big thing in organisations. And um, I'm going to look in a little bit of perspective for you um, individually, actually, today. So there's kind of three bits. What is observational intelligence? And secondly, teach you a little bit around that. Really understanding a piece around self, um, yourself actually, um, self-development um, and behaviours that could be impacting you in your own leadership roles. Um, and then sort of tying it all together around expectation and team development, which is another key area, critical area that I see um, needs, needs working on. So uh, I'm going to do this again, because I think this slide is really, really important. And for those of you who are new to, um, perhaps you didn't see the other two, so agile leadership is all about you, uh, but it's not actually, it's about your team. And look, it's your job, and I want to get really clear on this, it's your job to inspire others, to empower others, and to work out who you serve. And so by doing that, you create the conditions for your people to actually grow and develop into their own capacity and power. Um, so not only when you're in the trenches with them, but more importantly, when um, you're not there. And so that's the key. That's when the magic happens in terms of that, you know, I call it um, 
collective, um, collectively powerful, right? If you've got a leadership team and a team that's collectively powerful, that means we're actually using, if we went to, to um, session number one was inclusion and diversity, we're managing um, and developing potential and that is a key area. So I just wanted to run through that slide again. Okay, second thing is, what I want you to do today, this is new stuff. So, um, you know, for some of us, it can appear a little bit uncomfortable. And that's okay, because we're allowed to actually feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I'm gonna challenge some viewpoints around uh, probably more traditional leadership. And so therefore I have this model, which is we have this locked in thinking sometimes and the locked in thinking is just purely based on our experience. So what we've experienced is kind of what we do, right? Um, and because we know it, it works for us in a sense, um, we keep doing it. But I, what I wanna do is really challenge you today to kind of think outside of the square, look at things from a new lens, um, so unlock your locked in thinking. So if you can come and turn your mindset into going, well, if I was to come away from this session and do one thing, one thing differently, what would that be? And I'm gonna give you some time at the end, hopefully today, to actually come back through and go, okay, so what actually resonated for me through this process? What are the one, two or three things I'm gonna do for myself, my team, and or the organization. So where are the areas that I really, really want to work on? Because once we've unlocked our locked in thinking, we can innovate, right? So we can innovate our thinking, not about innovation in terms of technology or the business or evolving, it's innovating our own thinking. So imagine if, imagine if we could do this. And I don't know about you, but certainly in New Zealand, during our lock, um, lockdown or lock-in or isolation process around COVID-19, it gave a lot of people, a lot of leaders a chance to actually innovate some of the things around their teams um, that they had been grappling with in the workplace, but they were able to try some new stuff because they had everyone sort of calling in and connecting and it was a good chance to actually have everyone on a level playing field and actually start to drive some different discussions. So once we can innovate our thinking, then we can produce smart, right? So it's about what is it that we can actually deliver? What is it that we can implement? What is it that we can do that's a little bit smarter in terms of innovating that thinking process? So today I am gonna challenge you. For some of you, you might find it a little bit uncomfortable, but you know what, just go with it and come out of the end of it and I promise you that you will have one thing to take away at least. So I love this one again, it's looking at the lenses in a different way. So again, um, we, we'll take those glasses off and put them, put them on. So when we come to uh, behaviours and organisations, when we come to understanding ourselves as leaders, often what we end up doing is uh, we end up band-aid fixing, right? So we go, and, and that can become quite reactive in terms of our, our leadership team. So we can go, I've got an issue over here, I'm gonna go straight there and deal with it. Or I've got another issue here. Or we've got all of this stuff going on, why don't we just slap something together that allows us to get through to the next point. So often um, communication, so communication is, um, I call it, is the new currency, right? Because if we think about it, uh, the way that every single person walks in, and I think I said this last week, every single person walks into your organisation, whether they are remote, um, across locations, um, or one location, however, everyone shows up on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of their mindset is the direct correlation to the overall performance that the organisation gets. And although that sounds a little bit basic, you actually think about it and you go, wow, we try to create a culture in an organization that's based on a set of values and principles generally, but actually the culture is made up of every single individual that comes into that organization. And so instead of trying to make a cultural set of rules that allow people to be part of, we actually have to go and start to take responsibility from an individual level and go, 
What is it that I'm doing when I come into my organisation? How am I showing up in terms of my mindset, in terms of my leadership, in terms of am I actually, have I become complacent? Am I doing what I should be doing? Am I just doing enough? Am I coasting? Am I doing more? Because wherever that energy is in terms of that lowest point in energy is where everyone is going to gravitate to. So what I find is when we have a fixing or a band-aid type approach to culture, there's a whole lot of pockets of some really interesting behavioural dynamics that are going on. And what happens is communication is the key currency in there because communication is the only thing that people have, right? So whether it's written, verbal, uh, body language, how, whatever that communication style is, is actually in terms of the performance that the organisation is get, get. So is it the stuff that's not said? Is it the stuff that is said? What is the Band-Aid fix in your organisation? So whatever you're doing, because once we want to take that Band-Aid off, we start to get into the layers um, that's where we can start working on um, actually addressing um, some of the um, leadership development or some of the team development that's so important. One of the things I see is as organisations grow um, and we've got more and more people in there is that um, we get focused on delivering, which is awesome. But then we sit back and we go, okay, so if we know that um, people, when they they want to come in and work in an organisation, they want to feel inspired, they want to receive positive feedback, they want to understand where they belong, they want to understand that they're actually making um, impactful contribution to the organisation. I think I said this last week, right? So if people aren't quite sure of what their role and how that fits into the wider piece, if they're not developed in terms of some of the areas that they need developing in, guess what? You're going to end up completely with a Band-Aid fix um, team development model or a Band-Aid fix culture. So I want to have a little look in terms of that, uh, um, that today. But what this transpires into at times for me, and I get so frustrated when I go on site, is when I ask around um, organisational development or um, individual development competencies, I, I usually get, yep, we do that. Yep, absolutely, we do that. But when I delve into it, it's more that it's coming from a tick box or a check box um, process. So, yep, we've done a review. Um, has it been meaningful? Not sure, but we've done the review. And so we've put a tick in the box, um, that's done for another year. So my argument around um, organisational development, if we want to move from a Band-Aid fix, fix um, culture, Band-Aid fix leadership, in terms of being better leaders, is actually what are you doing to really develop your individual team members? And, and I guess I'm going to give you a little bit of a moment to stop and reflect on that while I just talk, because if you're not developing them individually, if that year review, guarantee that all of you do a year review of some description, and you're not really understanding the behaviours, the performance, the areas of development that they individually need in terms of growing them, then what you're doing is you are creating um, a, a tick box, a tick box culture that has you continue to get some of the behaviours that you get and some of the continuity of the band-aid fix. So one thing to think about is are you doing tick box um, development? And I guess that's either a yes or no. Because if I come in and go, so where is it that this person's at today? Here's how we know this, right? Where is this person at, at today? What are you trying to develop them in this quarter? And what is the overall scheme of things? So it should drop bottom down and top up. We'll go through a little bit of that later on. So, what we don't hear here. So, this is where observational intelligence came from, right? So really at a high level, it's the ability to learn and understand how to read others through patterns, right? 
So patterns are critical in observational intelligence. And often if we think about EQ, it's like empathy, being vulnerable. And we talked a little bit about this last week, showing emotion, um, you know, being transparent, being highly, um, you know, sensitive to others and being able to do that. But I think that that is part of it. But this piece is absolutely critical because if we don't understand how to read others, through a series of patterns, because often if we just look, we go, okay, well, that's my perspective on that particular person. But if we start to look at patterns, you will see a series of behaviors, then you'll see a series of outcomes that you get, and we've got to drill down. It's like, it's like the onion. We've got to go back to the core and understand where those um, patterns came from, what's driving those patterns, why, and then how do we recalibrate pieces within that in terms of my individuals? Because remember, an organization is made up of people and people communicate in a way and behave in a way that is uh, common or known to them and a safe thing. We'll come a little bit into that later on. So when we look at that, we've got um, the ability to understand and learn how to read others through patterns. Is um, we've, got, we've got body language, We've got a whole lot of stuff around communication. We've got emotional responses, right? And I guarantee when you start to understand and read patterns, the answers are so clear and so easily being able to see when you've got the pattern-based behaviors there. And that allows you then to communicate more efficiently because you're not trying to guess, you're not trying to avoid, you're not trying to... Um, put it on the back burner, you're actually having that conversation that really matters. And that allows you to get actions and development. And it, out, it also helps you to understand and regulate yourself. So understanding self is hugely critical as a leader um, before you can start to look at team development. And I'm going to go through a little bit of the reasons why. But observational intelligence is the ability to learn and understand how to read others through a series of patterns and understanding patterns. So if that's the case there, let's have a look. When we go and have a look at the definition of um, patterns, it's a regular and intelligible sequence discernible in which something is done. So if we have a look at patterns, it's a series of instances that has a set outcome or series of outcomes that relate it back to, but it's a pattern. So there's more than one in that series. And what that does is it can look at systems in terms of internal systems, how we think and process things in terms of mindset. There's an order or disorder, um, and we'll go through that in a little bit. Um, structure can be unstructured chaos or structured organizational structured chaos. And then there's a measurement piece in there. <clears throat> so how do we measure that pattern? How do we know that that's the piece that we're trying to change, right? If we're trying to change that bit, how do we measure that success? And often again, when I read these wonderful documents around 360 or um, performance reviews or whatever it is that we're trying to achieve, the measurement is too light it's too waffly and too light because you actually the translation of what it means is not there. So for example, you might have something that um, needs to develop uh, better communication skills. What does that actually mean? So if we were to look at that, we go, okay, um, the pattern is, is that every time this person goes into a team meeting, what they do is they create a disruptive element in those meetings and therefore um, they behave in a certain way and here's the set of patterns, here's a set of behaviours that go with that pattern. So then we start to unpack, well what does that actually look like? Is it is it the meeting structure? Is it How is that person wired in terms of their um, thought process and how they process information? Is it the way that that meeting's run? There's a whole lot of stuff that we can go down into that allows you really easily to see what's at the core of that person and why you're getting the behaviours that you're getting. So again, when you get to that root cause, something I've done for years, getting to the root cause of what the issue is, sounds kind of rocket, it's not rocket science, right? But 
often when we're talking about people, it becomes quite complicated because people are not consistent generally, right? So we're dealing with um, emotions, we're dealing with um, people's um, lives, and it seems to be that you know, as leaders, it's that one thing that we go, if only we didn't have to manage people, it would be great, happy to be a leader, but how do we manage, um, you know, if we take the people out, it would be awesome, right? So we've got, to, we've got to start to really understand passions, right? So passions, 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 a series, a regular, intelligible sequence, something happens and we have to look at what needs to be done. And generally, you know, there's a system, there's order or disorder, there's structure or no structure, and there's generally little measurement. So if we're starting to think about patterns, what do we do next? So um, what we know is that um, when it comes to understanding um, ourself, and our self-regulation and or self-care practices the outcome but self-regulation in terms of us as leaders and being agile in the leadership in, in our leadership space and our team is that when we understand truly how our team think what works for them their, their profiles I do an omnia behavioral tool profile which is fascinating because it gives me eight columns relatively quickly in terms of what that person's um, behavioural process is going to be and where are we going to come and stuck. So we, what we know is um, if, if we are feeling comfortable and showing up on a day-to-day -day basis in a, in a powerful state um, and we can understand and read that we're going to get an increase in emotional health and well-being because fundamentally that's not rocket science, right? If I'm feeling satisfied and I'm great in terms of who I am and the powerful and the contribution I make and I'm feeling like I understand everything that's going on around me, then I communicate <clears throat> generally way more powerfully because, and, and I'm also increasing my emotional health and well-being because I'm feeling, I'm feeling better. It also decreases stress in the workplace because I'm not putting that conflicting uh, piece on so it's not like I'm behaving differently when I have to meet with this person or I'm shutting down or I'm withdrawing over here and it doesn't matter where we are around the world we all see these patterns of stuff that happens in our organizations so decreased stress in the workplace has got to be a good thing it also helps to increase um, good decision making right so when we can see things in a non-personalized way um, then good decision making is made and it's very easy to say, I don't personalize, but I have it a guess if we were to go through this process when we go through it today, that some of you, when you are in a default-like state process, <clears throat> that your good decision-making skills go out the window. Um, it also allows us to increase our team development, which is what I've been talking about. And we have to do that, right? As leaders, agile leaders, this is what we need to do. Um, and it increases our own leadership competence and capability. So if we think about it, so observational intelligence is everyone is talking about, you know, emotional health and well-being. We're talking about stress. We're talking about making good decisions. We're talking about, we're not talking so much about team development in a sense, but we are talking about how do we be better leaders. So yes, um, adding this to your um, your leadership profile or competence is is really really important so i have this cycle um and it's really interesting because my observational intelligence book obviously that's coming out is more like um it's i call it a cluster book so it's a it's a book that's about this big but it's um got a whole lot of models in it um and an understanding of what observational intelligence is but it goes through a whole series of different um, perspectives on different issues in the workplace. And then how do you actually, um, what model can you use to actually step in and address that particular issue? So it's a book that can sit on your desktop that you can refer to in and out when you've got a challenge. Because part of the thing that I find is there's so much great theory out there, but the, the, the challenge is, how do you actually take that theory and implement it? And there's a big piece, so it's like in my practical toolkit of agile leadership um, tools, 
give me some stuff that I can easily understand and implement. And that's the, the piece in terms of this book where we're gonna where, where it covers a lot of this stuff. So as Billy said, you guys are, are getting um, a little bit of a, a snippet into, into this area. So I talk a lot, and you heard me last week, about interrupting the cycle. So in order to have observational intelligence, we've got a series of stuff that's happening. We might not have thought about it that way, but we've got to stop and go, right, what is my interrupt the cycle? So when we interrupt the current flow in the cycle, we then can start to observe the patterns. So what is going on for me? What's going on for my team? What's going on? Where is it that I'm seeing things that I'm doing the Band-Aid fix, right? I've got to start observing patterns. So once I can observe, and I'm writing them down, what are the patterns, right? Then I can understand the triggers. And I'll talk about a trigger in a little bit more and more detail, but a trigger is where we're going along and then all of a sudden something, there's actually four things um, that actually step in and challenge us, right? And at that point of challenge, from a mindset perspective, we go into a heightened emotional response state. And I'm gonna take you through where that came from today. So there's a trigger that happens. We react as individuals to that trigger and we flip our switch into a heightened emotional regula regulated response based on our learnings or past-based behaviors. So we've got to understand what the trigger is, how that's affecting the pattern, We've got to then analyze and go, okay, so what's the unmet expectation here for that particular person at that particular time, right? So um, uh, if I give you an example, um, if you've got a person that just, I'll use a relatively easy one, right? You've got a team member who is um, relatively inconsistent in terms of how they're showing up so some days they're really good and other days they're that it's really hard to get anything from them right? so when you actually start to observe the patterns what you may find in this case is <clears throat> every time i set up a one-to-one -one meeting or a team meeting with this person i notice that their behavior changes right or their the way they respond the way that they communicate changes so you've got to then so you start to really have a really nice understanding of when this happens what does this person do how are they showing up what's going on for them what's the body language what's the language what's the response mechanism that we're getting right so then if you came back and understood, so say this person, every time they had a meeting with me as their leader, as their manager, they became highly defensive, right? So what I would start to look at is go, wow, there's something that I am doing when I engage with this person that has them behave in a certain way. So when we start to go down and have a look at that, so I might go, well, how do I analyze their unmet expectation, because with every single behavior, every single pattern, there's an unmet expectation. Because if you think about that, if we didn't have an emotional heightened response to something, to a trigger, then we wouldn't have an unmet expectation because things would be fine. So something has happened to have us behave in a certain way that creates this unmet expectation. And that is where the gold is, right? So when we can analyze what the unmet expectation is, and it's usually something that's personalized to them because it's based on a past-based behavior pattern that they've learned. So the unmet expectation might be that every time they meet with me, I um, work with them in a way that has them very triggered because they feel like the challenging questions I'm asking or the way I'm asking those questions or how I'm expecting them to respond, how they hear it, because remember it's their perception, is that I don't value them or that they're not competent in their role or that 
um, they're actually uh, um, imposter syndrome or they're failing or one of those unmet, ex one or more of those unmet expectations will be full on driving at their space. So they will react in a certain way and that could be a defensiveness of behaviour, that could be a withdrawal from the situation, that could be any amount of behavioural patterns that they start looking at and, and doing. So when we actually step back and we go, holy gamoly, it's actually me, is it about that? So the unmet expectation is really the, un, in, in another sense of a word, is the unspoken problem. So I, I use things, I use problem a lot. I go, there's spoken problems and there's unspoken problems, right? So when we're looking at developing a person or a team <clears throat> or an organisation, there's a whole bunch of spoken problems. So that's like, um, the culture's terrible. <laughs> um, we're too busy. Uh, what else do we have? Um, there's no prioritization. Uh, there's no structure. So that, that's, a, that's a spoken, right? There's always, you know, there's always stuff going on. It's always, 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 it's, I'm on the hamster wheel. Life is busy. The culture isn't great. Um, my manager doesn't like me, all that sort of stuff, right? So that's a spoken problem. What we've got to do is come through to what is the unspoken problem. Because when you can actually get through observational intelligence and doing your homework and your patterning and understanding the behaviours and how they happen and why they happen and where they come from, then you can actually create that unmet expectation. Because actually it is... For that particular person, going back to my example, the unspoken is every time they have a conversation with me, they're in defend mode. And what that means is that they've put up a whole bunch of barriers because I remind them of someone that they, whether they're at school way back when, that they actually um, went through an experience and they felt like they weren't good enough. So at a default heightened emotional response level, that's the stuff that's playing out. So when I understand that, I can unlearn, I can start to unlearn the old patterns. So I go, oh, okay, right. So if I change the way that I work with them or engage with them or ask different questions in a different way, then I'm going to, I'm going to actually unlearn that pattern. So I'm going to put a new series of communication process in place with them to have them not go into that defend mode, to have them understand how they respond. And if I am <clears throat> totally in my agile leadership space doing my magic in terms of inspiring, empowering and serving, then I would actually coach them through some of those concepts. And an observational intelligence is really learning about how do I actually coach them through some of those processes. I'm not expecting that you become counsellors, psychologists, um, psychiatrists, and all of that other stuff, not at all. Um, and certainly um, your people and capability or human resources team would have kittens if you did that. But um, it's about really if you can actually delve down and start to do this piece, boy, it makes um, either performance management or understanding how to develop your team so much better, which actually allows you to bring in that inclusiveness, that diversity and the stuff we talked about last week in terms of having that collectively powerful team which which gets better results so so hopefully that's kind of given you a little bit of a of, of a um, understanding there so we've got to interrupt the cycle observe the pattern or patterns understand what's triggered them or what the triggers are analyze the unmet expectations which is i am so that's the unspoken problems unlearn it and relearn it sounds really easy right it takes time to go through this process but pretty much that is, if you were to do a full cycle in observational intelligence and understand that, that is where you're going to get the biggest gains. So we'll, we can come back to that later. Oh, I love this slide. One of the things and the patterns, I'm going to go through a couple of concepts now. One of the patterns that I see in organisations where we're really growing um, at, a, at a fast rate and um, we've got people everywhere doing stuff is, um, and especially from a leadership perspective, 
is this is my time-based value slide. And so the question that I'm going to pose for you now is rolling off the back of that last one around patterns is, am I spending my time adding my value in the right places? Now that makes, you know, you can go, yeah, 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 great. But actually, I want you to really delve down and go under, and, and go under the hood and go, am I spending my time adding my value in the right places? Because here's what I observe. Just say there was $100 for each day, right? $100 per day. And you had to split that $100 across um, multiple the areas that you work in. I'd love to know what that split would be. Because what I find often is as leaders, where we're thinking we're agile, we're actually going in and trying to fix. So I come back to my band-aid fixing. We're trying to fix things for our team rather than engage with them and help them and coach them through to finding that solution, right? So we're not developing them because what we're doing is we're coming in and fixing it. And we think that that's what we confuse uh, value and we confuse that with um, value, right? But actually, if you stepped up and you had a look back down, I guarantee if I asked you, if I went around the room now and asked, are you spending your time adding value in the right places? There would be very few of you that would come back and say, yep, I'm absolutely on track with that. Uh, this is where my value is and this is the time that I need to spend. Don't get hung up on the dollar value in terms of um, the you know, consulting rate or whatever it is that you are on site. <clears throat> this is time-based value. So it's a really nice concept to start to look at in agile leadership. One of the patterns for you is, well, where are you spending your time and is it creating the value? More importantly, where are the gaps? right? Where are the gaps in terms of value? So I'll give you about 30 seconds to kind of just jot down some notes on that. I think it's really, really important. Am I spending my time adding my value in the right places? I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. That seems about there. There we are, move through. So contribution, impactful contribution. You've seen the slide. We need to understand what our impactful contribution is. And in order to be agile leaders that understand and interpret behaviors and understand observation and intelligence, we need to understand some about ourselves. And so today, what I want to take you through is a couple of concepts that I'm going to sort of go through relatively quickly. But it's really important from a leadership perspective that if I'm going to go out and look at observational intelligence, and understanding and meeting expectations and or and interpreting behaviors, then I better understand a lot about myself, more about myself than I probably have ever thought about. So I've created a, a professional development model, and I reckon that we go through six, we should go through about six or seven cycles of this particular model throughout our career. This isn't age-driven, it's cycle-driven. So again, remember the patterns we talked about. This is a seven series of patterns over a career span. So here's my thing around professional development and this cycle, right? First, you have huge aspiration, right? So you come into a role or a project or something in terms of where you're at right now in your in your life, in your professional life, yeah, or your home and professional, because remember, we're not segmenting ourselves. We are one person. And you have a whole lot of aspirations for doing some really cool stuff, right? And then you're totally inspired. So you come into a project or a role and you're totally inspired by what you see and what you do. So there's this high sense of um, heightened emotion, there's passion, there's energy, there's inspiration, there's loads of, of fun and taking things on. Then there's generally a whole lot of perspiration. So perspiration, I've got to roll up the sleeves, I've got to work jolly hard to actually get to the end of that cycle. So there's a whole lot of perspiration. Some of you might be in this perspiration mode now where you feel like at times that you cannot put your head up, that there is nothing outside of that. All you can see is just the stuff coming down on you at this fast rate of knots in terms of what you have to achieve. 
And at some point in that cycle, there's an exploration mode, right? So exploration is, is this it? Is this, is this what I want to do? Is this as good as it gets? Is this everything that I need right now? Or is, is there something missing? And this can be a personal thing, this can be a home thing, this can be, um, a, or a work or a combination of all of the above. It's not kind of like a midlife crisis, but it is an exploration mode, because remember, we're going to go through six or seven of these over our, our career life cycle. And then we've got to have an expiration, not necessarily in the organisation, but it's, it's an expiration of that cycle. So we might come to the end of a particular challenging time where we've gone actually I've done everything I can do here I've learned everything I can learn I've really activated and I've done the best I can I need a new challenge now or I need to find some inspiration back outside of work for myself or you know what I am just a little bit done and I think I need to go and do something else so um, expiration is at the point where we've got to go back into our cycle again so really it doesn't matter, you don't need to go through aspiration, inspiration, perspiration, expiration. You can go from perspiration to expiration, find some more inspiration and come back around the cycle again. So the question I'm going to leave you with here is, um, you know, where, where are you at in your cycle, right? Because I guarantee that if we looked at the patterns of behaviour, if you were, say, in perspiration mode, I guarantee, because remember you are the mirror, what you do is what you see is what you get. So for your team, what you do is what you see is what you get. The perspiration mode is going to be key because they're going to be mirroring you, right? So here's the thing. It's like if you're in perspiration mode and you can't see an out, you're going to have to find some other inspiration or some aspiration somewhere to bring that back in. Otherwise, your dissatisfaction level with where you're at is going to be huge. The same as if you're coming into exploration, right? You've come out a whole lot of hard work and go, well, actually, where in the organisation do I want to do some stuff now? What is it that I want to develop and where do I want to do stuff, right? Because once we actually start to do that, then we can move through that cycle. And remember, seven times that we should, over our career life cycle, have this. So the question is, the two, there's two questions or two parts to this. Where are you at in your current cycle and where do you want to move to next so that's a question I'm going to leave you again and obviously you'll get these slides but when you have some time working on you or your business remember we talked about that every week I'm sorry every week for the last couple of weeks is where am I spending my time am I spending my time adding value one thing to be adding value and is am I spending my time by myself an hour a week working on my team on my business on my stuff right so where are you at in your cycle and where do you want to go next, more importantly, and then what is it that you need to do to get there? So that's the two questions that we're starting to understand a pattern around yourself. Yeah. So the next thing is around um, energy and energetic imprint, right? Because we've got to understand our energy source in terms of our own energy cycle because um, being if we're in perspiration mode and we've got stuff going on everywhere we'd better start to manage self-care right and we've talked a lot about self-care in terms of the last agile leadership you know mental health and well-being health and safety in the workplace all of those things around emotional wellness we better start to understand how we function um, ourselves before we can start to really understand the patterns of others so that's a big key area so I use the smoothie because smoothies are generally around the world relatively um, healthy and wholesome, right? And they're clean, clean food. So um, for those of you who are more numbers oriented, I put some numbers over here on the left and those are more words, I've, I've put them on the right. So choose whichever way you want to go. But if we imagine that a smoothie is, um, is either empty, full or, or um, totally full, right? This is you. So often what I hear people say is, um, if I'm feeling a little bit disillusioned or stagnant, I'm feeling empty. So I hear people say all the time, I'm just empty. There's just nothing left in the tank. And so what that means is that when we're feeling empty, 
there's chaos. Chaos is reigning over our lives. There's um, turmoil. We're we're busy. We 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 say we hear too busy, too busy. We can have some victim-like behaviours. Where's confusion? We do confusion if we're sitting in there because we just can't see outside of our little world here. There's just too much going on, and we're feeling disillusioned. And when we feel disillusioned, what that kind of goes up to is there can be some complacency and some stagnancy, especially after a period of time. If we've done the same thing the same way for a long period of time, we've got to interrupt the cycle, right? Got to interrupt the cycle because we've got to move and grow and evolve. When we move and grow and evolve, we grow and evolve our team. So we're feeling empty, right? The next piece, I love this word, percolating perspective. So when we're full, we become aware and satisfied. And this is where the, our mind starts to get really clear, right? So we've got loads of structures happening. We're undisturbed in our emotional mind. We're not, we're not reacting to everything. We're actually just focused. There's stuff going on, right? So we've got really good energy, energy source here, and there's um, structures evolving, and it's feeling a whole lot better for us rather than being empty. And then we move into this um, health shot of life, which is the top one, right? So this is like grana or um, putting you know, wheatgrass on top of it, which just gives us that zing. This is where the magic happens, right? So in that 80 to 100%, that's where we get so disciplined and so focused and we have high performance and we're really highly tuned. Now, if I was to ask each of you and go around the room and say, have you been in a position where you felt like you're in that really top, top third of that smoothie? Most of you would go, yep, absolutely. I have been and I'll go, how did that work out? And you go, that was amazing, stuff happened. <clears throat> the patterns were, you know, um, sales were coming in, projects were going well, um, you know, everything just came together. My team was working amazingly. How long did you stay there? Oh, not that long, right? So really interesting point is that we know that that's a great space to be, but we don't never stay there that long because we drop, right? So the question here around when you understand your energy cycle it's really important to understand what you can do to go and replenish or when you're in it. Because if you're down and empty, then there's a correlation to remember you are the mirror. So what you do is what you see is what you get. And so if you have got chaos around you, then it's likely that your team is going to be mirroring that same pattern. Yeah. So start to have a look. So the question I have with this one is what is your energy cycle? So for example, for me, I stay relative, because I'm trained in, in this stuff, right? So I'm relatively highly engaged at that top level a lot of the time. But when I drop, I don't go through the middle, I just go straight to empty, right? So I just oscillate between the top and the bottom. Th that's my cycle, right? So I know when I get down there, there's some self-care things that I need to do, because it's generally I've been been pushing myself too hard and so I've got to come back into getting that um getting getting the structure and the and the undisturbed stuff and getting meditation and all that other stuff back into my my life which generally will have me back up there right so what the question for you to think about um over the next week when you get this presentation is what is your energy cycle right what is it and then where are you at right now so if some of you are sitting in empty we need to get you up to at least full, right? Some of you will go, will sit at full and sort of oscillate between empty. You may not even get to hell shot of life. This is where, when you're doing your best work, this is when you're in that full to, to highly empowered. So what do we need to do for you? What do you need to do as an individual in terms of getting from full to hell shot of life? Start to think about what it is that you can implement in terms of work, in terms of self, in terms of um, emotional health and well-being, in terms of behaviours, in terms of structure, to actually have you stay at that percolating perspective or satisfied and enabled. And those of you who are sitting here going, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I stay at enabled 80 to 100% most of the day, I'd really challenge that and go, okay, so your goal is to have a look at the series of patterns over the next week at the end of the day, jot in at the beginning of the day, jot in at the end of the day, and have a really good look at where you actually go with that. Because 
energy now in terms of emotional health and well-being is being seen as part of this yeah because we've got burnout we've got increased stress indicators we've got all of this other stuff going on here driven by some external factors some internal the more we understand ourselves and our patterns the more observationally aware we can become with others this is a great exercise to run with team as well seems to be one of these ones so i've had it for years but if i come back out of a feedback from a workshop with teams this is the thing they remember a lot of it's like oh yeah i'm in the bottom of the smoothie again how do i get myself out of there okay so when we come into behaviors <laughs> here's the interesting thing so i'm going to give you a little bit of neuroscience and behavior stuff right in a relatively short period of time so this is the 60 second neuroscience view so really as an individual we have a choice to live in one of two states so it's kind of like we come with um two 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 buttons right we have a default setting and we have a power setting. So obviously the power setting is the more um, consistent one we wanna be in. So remember I came back to the beginning and I talked about patterns and I talked about um, understanding the emotional triggers or the triggers and then the unmet expectations. So the trigger and the unmet expectation will have you move into a default setting, right? So. When we go into a default setting, we kind of go, well, why do we hang in that default setting? We hang there, and most of us who haven't done any personal development work at all and don't understand patterns and never really thought about things like that, we stay there because it's perceivably safe. And if you think about that, when we're, when we're born, in terms of our, our mind, and I think I said this last week, our mind is such a powerful tool, right? We create, whatever we want we can create whatever we want with our thought patterns and structures right and what's really interesting for me is we probably only use about 10 percent of it and if you look at all the neuroscience piece around um, functionality and how to really drive and get what we need but most of us tend to use it in this default thinking versus our power state thinking right so we stay there because it's safe, because what we've learnt when we um, when we develop as as from babies into you know child me, teen me, um, those are the patterns that we actually start to take on and embrace. And I'll go a little bit into that. Um, <clears throat> default can be very serious. It's something that we have learned to cope and strategies. We've put patterns of behaviours around us, right? And it can be that we're very serious, significant and dramatic. And when we're very serious, significant and dramatic, we kind of get what we need. We can be and revert to a childlike state. And you may see around you, it's interesting because I'll go to board level meetings and I'll see childlike behaviours. Things like, my boss doesn't like me. So that's a highly personalised conversation and I can go find evidence everywhere to prove that in a childlike state that that is true. So when we're in default we become a little bit disconnected with ourselves and it becomes very tactical. The stuff we do is just really step by step by step right and we can actually create a little bit of dysfunctional energy for ourselves. So we're in that bottom third of the smoothie right so we're creating we're almost creating this in terms of ourselves. So our mind I want you to remember our mind is it's a couple of things. Our mind is super, super powerful, right? We're going to use about 10% of it. And most of the time it's not used in a power state. It's going back to talk about our internal dialogues and how we think and feel about ourselves. Versus in a power state, when we're in power state, we're actually setting inspirational goals. So we're actually looking at our own purpose. Yeah, we're understanding. Remember, I went right back to number one, understand your purpose. Understand who you are as a leadership persona, when we can understand and identify that and we live it, God, we're owning our story down here. Um, we understand our core values and how much and our intrinsic motivators. We're doing self-development work. This is what you're doing, yeah? You're starting to understand more about how you tick because the more you understand about how you tick and your passions, the easier it is to be able to observe others. Um, you have choice. You have choices which because choice gives you freedom around how you um, choose to show up. You're very connected 
and you're in an empowered state. So the two things to remember is you're either in a default or power setting, right? You can't be in both of them at one time. You're going to be in one or the other. And it's really interesting to start. The thinking here is if you can imagine this. So your brain is kind of like a projector. I need to come up with a new term for that. It's actually filming your thinking. So whatever you are thinking up here is going to be filmed every day. So however you wake up every day, remember I said how every, how every person goes into an organisation, however they show up, is a direct correlation to the overall performance of the organisation. Whatever it is that you are playing in terms of your internal story or dialogue or inner critic is another word for it, whatever it is that you're thinking is actually going to film your thinking, you're going to find evidence everywhere to screen that back to you, which is fantastic if you're in a power state, right? So if you're in a power state going, agile leadership is what I do, I am owning my story, I am totally empowered, I'm empowering, inspiring and serving my team and my customers and life is amazing I'm at the top of the quadrant of the smoothie, life is just fantastic, right? How cool is that? That is going to be screened back to you because you can find evidence everywhere in terms of whatever it is that you're thinking, yeah? Versus waking up and going, oh my goodness, today's another day. Do I really have to go to work? Um, I am feeling like I'm not valued. Just use that one as another example. I'm just not valued in this organization. So therefore that's my perception of how I feel. So I'm gonna screen that out to everyone and it's gonna come back to me because I can find evidence. Remember your mind is so, so powerful. I can find evidence everywhere to prove whatever I think, regardless of whether it's the reality or not. And so this is where we need to start to get really clear in our observational intelligence in terms of, is this a perception or is this actually, which is personalized, or is this a perspective? So the output from this slide here is, what is it that you are doing when you get up in the morning and you're playing that movie? What is it that you are playing in terms of having it come back to you? And if you're not happy with what you're getting around you, then you have to come back to self and start to look at what is that default thinking movie that is that is running your life because it's screening everything and coming back. So the neuroscience piece, I'm not going to go too much into this, but um, basically what happens is uh, we're all kind of born as babies. Our brains, are, the neuroplasticity in the brain is, is empty. It's like a sponge. And what it wants is it wants to take in stuff. So I, I call this a, a timeline, a, a context timeline. So in order to start to understand our trigger points, um, we have to kind of go back to 0 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, or 15 plus. And when we start to remember whatever it is around this area that comes up for us, um, that's the stuff that is sitting in that safe box um, for us when we learn. So if we're uh, adopted, a twin, there's some really interesting dynamics that come through genetic um, twin, twin like, uh, whoever comes out first. Uh, second, there's some really internal DNA type stuff that has experience in the womb that, that is really fascinating, um, or adoption in terms of feeling um, a sense of belonging or, or not. So um, when we start to really understand uh, what our what we what we saw and perceived at that time, because remember it's our perception and how we experienced um, situations and our environment. What comes out of this is I call it an I am statement. And the I am statement is the start of the piece that develops our behavioral patterning. Yeah. So and it's great now because what we're finding now is organization now is starting to go holy gamoli. So as leaders, we need to be really clear that, yes, we can teach Agile. Um, yes, we can teach emotional intelligence. Yes, we need to be more emotionally um, savvy. But if we don't understand ourselves and our own trigger points, then how can we choose to be vulnerable or add a sense of empathy or understand how and, and how to react and respond to and um, look after our teams? And so when we understand what this is, what happens at this point right from zero to five is it's like, it's like an onion. And I think I might have mentioned this the other week. 
we start at the core of an onion, right? And then we start to build all these layers because as we go through these experiences and our brain is relatively empty and it's a sponge and it's taking all the stuff on, we're actually creating a whole lot of thought patterns that subconsciously are just sitting there. We don't know that at the time, right? And so for some of us, it can be highly traumatic. For some of us, it can be, it, it doesn't matter what the trauma is. Uh, for example, I might lose my cat when I'm five. And that's hugely important to me. So I have this sense of not wanting to lose stuff because I lost my cat when I was five. It doesn't mean that that trauma is any less important than me having, um, you know, lost my dad at five. You know, it's 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 the same. It's the same trauma. It's different trauma, but it's it, it depends on 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 the individual. And so when we start to understand ourselves what we do is we create these layers and then we put ourselves in a box because we learn some strategies to deal with that and for some of us our core is barricaded up <laughs> so no one can get there um, and so when you think about it when we come into the workplace what we have is the childlike behaviors come from this sense here because we have created a series of patterns <laughs> that we do ourselves to ourselves in terms of understanding when we get triggered, we will respond emotionally in a certain way and it's all based back on this stuff, right? So, um, so we've almost got us, we've created all the years of building up these layers from our core. And so what we do is we almost take it back to the core to go all the way back through it. And so that's just a little bit in terms of how your thoughts and beliefs and behaviors um, implement or affect in terms of how you respond and react in certain ways. So how your team respond and react in certain ways. Once we understand the trigger points, then that's the fantastic start. So I, I say that there's four default um, triggers, right? So remember right back at the beginning, in order to understand the pattern, we've got to interrupt the cycle. So we know that um, when I'm triggered by something, I'm going to go back into my childlike thinking and that's going to run me, right? So we've got to learn not only what the thinking is and the behaviours that I do, but here are the triggers and there's generally four. And you will have, when you're triggered, uh, one or more of these that happen more often than others. So the person is... Um, the person is um, someone that reminds me of what I've observed through that zero to 15 generally, right? So the person isn't actually the person, but this is where it becomes really real or personalized. It's the person that I think it is the person, but actually it's, it's the behaviors and the way that person presents that reminds me of what I've had back here. So I become triggered every time I'm around that person, which is really important distinction. Situation is every time, for example, I go into this meeting with this client, I get triggered, right? So I don't know what it is, because often we'll know this, I've got, I just go into my thing, and I call it a personal lens cycle, so I go into my cycle around having to set myself up and deal with that. Or for some of you, it'll be self, right? It'll be every time I come out of that session with Rebecca, I um, I self-analyze. So I'm going all the way home and I'm thinking all the stuff I should have said, could have done differently, I'm triggering myself. Yeah. And then the environment is every time I show up at work, use that as an example, um, I feel like I'm triggered and I'm withering away. It just, just isn't working for me. I'm just not growing and developing. So the environment is triggering me or every time I go home or whatever that is, right? So you will have one or more of those triggers that happen every single time. And so will your team. So remember, power state, fantastic. Top of the quadrant of the smoothie, everything's going really well. Boom, something happens, triggered by one or more of these, revert into the mind thinking and the movie we play and then what gets screened back to us is the evidence that we can find in terms of everything there. So that's how the behavioural settings um, work and in terms of um, in an organisation this is the stuff that we need to, to kind of get present to. So what I've created and again I'm not going to go too much into this because I'm just looking at the time is um, 
oh, I love this stuff, is default identity behaviors, right? So we have um, created six, because although we don't do the um, the zero to 15 in, uh, in a group session, because that would be highly personal, it's highly personalized. Um, what we do have is we have this set of um, behavioral types that show up when we are in our trigger state. And what's really interesting is if you can imagine if you've got a team meeting that isn't going so well and everyone is um, in their default thinking state, then this is the stuff that's playing out. So you've got a dominant controller who um, has to be in control all the time and they need to know what's happening. So their big thing is being out of control. So their one thing is being so out of control because it's fearful around that, that they'll try and control everything, right? And you'll know those because they can come into a meeting, for example, and manipulate that whole meeting agenda to get what they want. Right, so they are so powerful in terms of that strong, strong personality. The saboteur will be the one that comes in and just sits there and just throws stuff in the middle of the table and then sits back and watches everything. They know exactly what they're doing. They do repetitive, um, destructive behavior. So the saboteur is someone that is, they absolutely know generally very, very strong as, as well. Um, and their big thing is, um, uh, communication so um, they they'll do patterns around they know they're definitely doing it but they'll keep doing it then we've got the victim type behavior which is that poor me so they're actually hugely in control as well because they'll go out and go you know what I'm powerless to change anything here so I'm going to keep doing this behavior because then I don't actually have to take any responsibility then we've got the confused and don't know. So um, they're the ones that you'll hear them say all the time, I'm so confused, I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't understand, I don't know, I'm confused. We've got the busy bee who is had by technology. So they are hugely busy. So they use busy as a distraction for having to deal with themselves and create space. So they are hugely problematic because they do not like confrontation. And then we have the rescuer rescue martyr actually so they're on one sense trying to rescue and fix everybody and then on the other sense they get a little bit frustrated with that in themselves so they they go into this martyr type mode so when we understand what our team dynamic is and again the patterns around going into this default thinking state and what triggers us to get in there then we can start to actually collectively go boom huh Rebecca you've just gone straight into dominant controller mode so what's happening when you have a look at that so if you've got a team and say you've got 10 people that go into busy two controllers and um, a couple of saboteurs, you've got a really interesting mix. So that's a really nice starting point to, to think about. I might send you the, um, the one pager as well, um, as, so you can have a look at the distinctions for that. So I guess the next piece really is when we're in that default thinking mode and our behaviors are as they are, there's only two places it can be, right? One is our perception, um, and the perception is not real, but we think it's real at the time, right? Because we don't know anymore. We're screening this evidence back at us. And then it becomes highly personalized. So again, when we're in this space as leaders, we have to be really careful that we're not into that personalization mode and looking and it's how it becomes our perception. Because observational mode is about becoming aware. We've got to make sure that we're in that we're not in perception that we're actually looking at it from a perspective. And that's where the patterns are brilliant, right? So the perspective is the depersonalized. So it's totally depersonalized. Um, I'm not making it mean anything about myself and my leadership or my team or the individual or the client or whatever it is. It is what it is, right? So an adult thinking is around perspective, depersonalized, and it's real. Um, childlike thinking, again, is personalized perception and not real. So again, default state, power state, where did it come from? It came from, you know, how we think every day. This is what we're screening back to us. Where it came from is the series of behaviors that we learned based on the situations and environment that we grew up in. What that did in terms of um, subconsciously embedding some patterns that allows us to play out roles in the organization when we're really starting to understand um, when we don't get what we want or we become in that tightened trigger process. And then we become um, 
either personalized in default or power state and perspective. So we've got to always look at the patterns from that um, depersonalized perspective way. So in um, OI, um, observational intelligence, here's the, here's the process that I want you to go through. So understand that and identify the patterns. So look for all the patterns, right? Start to look there. Then you've got to understand the behaviours that are behind the patterns. So what actually are the behaviours that you're seeing that are attached to that pattern? Yeah. Once you understand the pattern and the behaviours, I promise you, you'll be able to then go, well, what do I want to shift? Because we've got to shift something, right? Interrupt the cycle, shift something, establish the outcomes, and then um, decide on what those actions are, right? So once you've got the outcomes, then the actions are the how. So the pattern is critical, the behaviour is even more critical, then once, what is it that you're trying to shift? So that's the measurement, and then the actions you'll find will sit nicely in under there. A <clears throat> couple of things on team development around that OI and patterns. Um, if you're new to not experienced in and wanting to get a different result with your team in terms of development now coming out of today, I'll leave you with two things, right, in terms of patterns, right? Is the individual's behaviour driving the competency or is the competency driving the behaviour? Two very distinctive things, so is behaviour driving competency or competency driving behaviour? Often when we're in a personalised thinking we'll go, that person is a behaviour and um, is is um, not great, and therefore we are, you know, that they're they're um, uh, a pain in the organisation, and so I want to move them on, right? But actually, we've got to be really, really clear when we're developing them: is do I actually understand what's what's driving the behaviour? So, what is that trigger? Uh, what are the patterns? What's the what? What am I trying to achieve? Have I actually developed them in the areas and supported them in the areas that they need supporting in? Right. So this is particularly important where it's emotional stuff that we're dealing with, um, where we're trying to make some changes, <clears throat> because otherwise you can get yourself in a whole lot of strife around human resources and people and capability <clears throat> and organisational. Um, uh, you know, personal grievances, etc. In terms of, we've got to be really, really clear: is the behaviour driving their competency, or is their competency or not understanding driving the behaviour? Because you can, you can do the the second one. You can train and cross skill and learn there. The first one is a little bit more tricky, especially if the behaviours are um, out out the gate. So uh, again, I think just to finish off, um, patterns, so you've got a series of expectations, you've got to wrap some structure around it, you've got to put some measurement in it, and then there also has to be that accountability, discipline and self-care piece, right? So in order to start to look at patterns and interrupting the cycle, you've got to actually commit to being consistent in actually measuring and getting the change, otherwise it's just another sort of process that go through that you go oh yeah well that didn't kind of work so um, I'll try something different so it creates that self-care and discipline and consistency is hugely important ah and look I think just coming <laughs> coming here sometimes when we've never remember I said right at the beginning we've never really dealt with or thought about well this is quite new stuff right so observational intelligence again is a framework that I've developed over the last couple of years in terms of working with leaders and in organisations with their teams, right? It's okay right now not to have all the answers because sometimes this stuff, if we're not dealt with some of or understand our own patterns, which is why I sort of wanted to hone in on some of those things today, and that's only a few of them, but you don't need to have all the answers, right? We're not asking you to go in and actually be that coach, that psychotherapist, the psychologist, the whatever. What we're asking you to do is really, what I'm asking you to do, is really to go in and understand what's actually going on. Because remember the one I put up the other week was what stands in the way is the way until you shift it. And that's the behavioural type, that's the stuff, that's where the unspoken is. Whatever that unspoken problem is, in terms of what you're trying to achieve, there's always an unspoken. 
And so that's where, if you can get that right and start to look at that through patterns and observations and understanding more about where it's come from and the trigger process and why people react and respond. And yes, you're only using 10%. How do I get people to do more? That's all part of team development. So you don't need to have all the answers, right? It's just about starting the process and working with your people and capability team in terms of um, helping you to really develop that team and develop your individuals. Because really, just to finish off, it comes back to you, right? Your job as a leader is to inspire, empower and serve your team so that when you're in the trenches with them, fantastic. But more importantly, when you're out of it, because you're collectively, you're creating this collectively powerful, you know, group of people and organisation that has individuals show up every day in a way really owning, really owning how they individually show up, you can have a much more collectively power culture, powerful culture. So I think that's me. Oh, you get to choose every day, right? So choice is huge for me because I'll say to leaders, if you choose to do this stuff, if you want to make a difference, there's lip service or there's actually making a difference. So actually it's about accountability. And for me, it's like, if we want to choose to make a change, then you get to choose every day whether you want to do it or not. And it's not okay to, in a leadership role, in my opinion, is to go, you know what? Um, I'll do it today, but I might not do it tomorrow. If you're trying to make a difference in terms of your leadership persona and own who you are and own your story, then the choices that you make are incredibly powerful and you need to choose wisely. So I think that's my end. I'll um, hand back to you, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was, that was, that was brilliant. Um, it's you know some some great information and uh, you know I suppose uh, you know it doesn't matter how much we, we think we're self-aware or uh, you know we we try to understand or um, or you know do the best or get the best out of other people there is always room for improvement. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, uh, now after the session number three, um, again, Rebecca, thank you so much for for uh, for you sharing uh, with us uh, this material. It's 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 just great. Um, thank you for dedicating your time to us. Um, Welcome. And uh, we would like to present you with the appreciation certificate. Thank you. <laughs> I really enjoy doing these. So yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. So um, just for our attendees, uh, if you uh, wish to contact Rebecca, you can contact her on her email, which is Rebecca at uh, paradigmshift.co.nz, uh, or through her email, which is paradigmshift. Uh, uh, through her website, uh, which is paradigmshift.co.nz. So um, you know, if you have um, uh, if you wish to discuss any of of the of material subjects, um, uh, you know something in particular with uh, with Rebecca, she she is accessible through her email and um, and Paradigm Shift website. Um, um, and uh, uh, what we always do uh, next thing is on. Um, um, on our questions and answers. So as I begin, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there were a couple of uh, questions that we didn't manage to answer uh, last week. So sure. we will present them to Rebecca now. So Rebecca, one of the questions was um, how to improve management skills and develop work experience. And I suppose you know that that goes, um, you know applying um you know what we have heard uh from you you know over the last three sessions oh that's a that's a big question isn't it <laughs> how to improve management skills and work experiences wow so actually um it's probably a nice question to actually fit in to today because i think if we're talking about management skills and work experience I think one of the things we have to really be honest with ourselves as leaders in an organization is understanding um, 
firstly what we're trying to improve <laughs> Um, and I think actually probably quite nicely comes into observational intelligence, right? So in terms of management skills, we've got to look at baseline first, right? So if we understand what baseline is and the series of patterns that we're trying to, um, so, so I guess if we go, you know, look at success, so we've got baseline and we've got success over here, what does success look like is a really nice high level starting point where we can actually go, well, I know what success looks like and here's my baseline and so here's how I'm going to get those improvements through that process. Um, so that's really where I would always start and start to look at the patterns that I'm seeing and everything that we've talked about today in terms of performance, in terms of organisation, in terms of you know what is the unsaid in our organisation. So if I know that I need to improve my individual or my management team then what's the unsaid, what are the unspoken problems in the organisation, what's been said, and then work through the unspoken, because whatever that unspoken is, is where you really need to develop and improve your management team or skills individually and collectively. And I think in terms of work experience, how do we improve work experience? Um, work experience um, comes on a raft of topics, right? And again, I think it comes back to do we understand the metrics that we're trying to measure um, across the organisation? Are we really clear that A, are they the right metrics? Because again, if we're measuring stuff that's not important, then ultimately the result isn't going to get us what we need. So I think it's the same process with work experience, right? So it's like, what are we trying to achieve, right? What do, we, what do we want that to look like? Where are we today in terms of baseline? And then we map the gap. Yeah, so everything we go through is that process along the journey. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I think I think that 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 covers uh, you know that covers um, that covers the work experience and management. As you said, you know it's a very broad uh, broad question, and uh, and you you can you know you can address it from 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 uh, you know from uh, professional side, technical side, leadership side. Um, right. Yes, yeah. So um, thank you for that. Um, the next one: um, How to resiliently work as ladies in construction field from your mm. point of view. Wow, <laughs> that's a big <laughs> question, right? How do you resiliently work as, as ladies in construction field? Yeah, look, um, I, um, I understand, um, yeah, so, so what I would probably do there is resiliently work as women in construction, right? So already there's probably some barriers that we have in place as females anyway, right? And I think part of um, if you're committed to self-development, I think the resilience comes from that self. And a lot of what we talked about last week is the self-development process that we put ourselves through. Because a lot of it is coming back to again today is what is the stuff that's triggering us in our industry? What can we control? What's in our control? and what's out of our control, right? So the, the distinction there for me is what's in our control is we can depersonalize and control that, right? What's out of our control, whatever that is in terms of barriers um, for us, then um, often that's where we get confused and we start personalizing what's out of our control. And we can't fix that because it's not in our control to fix but we can depersonalize and not attach meaning to that. And that's the power of resilience. So resilience comes from no longer attaching meaning to the things that are out of our control that we can't control. Now we can only control ourselves, how we respond, how we react, what we can do, and ensure that we keep ourselves as I like to call it, <laughs> sounds a bit weird, but emotionally clean, right? So if we're emotionally clean and clear and we're really clear that, you know, we're doing everything in terms of understanding and, and owning our story and our power and our brand and all of that stuff we've talked about over the last three weeks and we understand our own self-development and our trigger process hugely, then 
um, we're going to react and respond in a much more powerful way. So work on the stuff we can control, work on how we act, not react, and depersonalize and stop attaching meaning to the stuff we can't control because we're never going to be able to control that, but we can get so much, so many more gains over over here, which is in the end going to make us hugely more resilient. Yeah, yeah. It's a whole so, big topic, right? Huge topic, but yeah. So, and uh, you know, having uh, sort of you know being in construction, you know, ever since I I joined the workforce, um, yes. definitely you know very good advice and and. Uh, uh, staying emotionally clean, as you said, it does help us to detach ourselves, you know, not carry it with ourselves, to take it for what it is, do what we can, and, um, and you know, just, just, just learn from whatever it happens. Uh, you know, we loved, uh, uh, we loved the thing that you said last time, you know, you fought a similar volume and you say life doesn't get easier or more uh, forgiving, we just get stronger and more resilient. And, totally. uh, yeah, and I think actually if we just let go of the attachment of meaning, that in itself is hugely powerful. No longer having to justify or defend or do all of that stuff that isn't going to work for us if we just stay in our own lane. I often used to stay in your lane, right? If you stay in your own lane and be hugely powerful in terms of not not powerful in ego perspective, but powerful in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Remember when you shift, everyone else shifts. So you're gonna get a different result anyway. And if I can just, yeah, that resilience, if you understand your trigger points and a lot of that context timeline and be able to let it go and not attach meaning, stay in your lane, that's just gonna be hugely powerful for you, not having to carry the other stuff around anymore physically or emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the beginning, uh, you spoke about the uh, the basically, um, you know, uh, uh, four types of thinking. Uh, you know, locked in, unlock, innovate, and produce smart. And um, locked in thinking, it's probably you know the first and uh, and 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 biggest one to to sort of you know what is that that uh, you know that uh, we have learned throughout uh, our experiences, um, you know, uh, uh, wherever they were, how long uh, they lasted, um, you know, sort of developing these behaviors based on the circumstances that we went through and then basically practicing, you know, um, whether or not uh, 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 being aware of it or not, basically carrying them with us and impacting, uh, uh, you know, uh, colleagues or you know our teams um, with um, with something that um, you know potentially you know if the life was uh, difficult then you know why would be easy now why would be easier for yes. somebody? Uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, what would be your advice in terms of? Uh, when um, uh, when we catch ourselves in uh, in sort of you know doing something um, doing something that uh, it's driven by uh, by our own experiences uh, you know but not necessarily being fair to 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 our teams you know how to sort of recognize that um, in time and and you know be 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 consciously, you know, make a conscious effort to, to, to minimize that? Yeah, really good question. And again, um, this is the stuff that's going to come out in the observational intelligence book. And so what, what we do is, so when you're aware, because what we have to do is we, we can't shut down the default thinking, right? It, it, we will never eliminate it because it's always going to be there. What we have to do is get in that split second, because even I will go into default thinking, yeah? But it's getting in that setting of understanding ourselves enough to unlearn and relearn the, the change, right? So when we go, oh, boom, that's me doing my thing again. And I guarantee when you understand what it is and you know it, that you know when you're doing it. So nine times out of 10 when I speak to someone and we go through their cycle, trigger cycle, they know exactly 
what is the story they tell themselves and what are the behaviours that they do. So what we have to do is we go, okay, it's that split second of recognition of it. Okay, it's a bit clunky at the beginning, right? I'm there, I'm in it. Okay, it's me going into that. So what triggered me? So in your mind, you're going, what triggered me? Okay, right, so boom, bang, I get to choose to move or stay. And actually it comes down to, I mean, there's a whole lot of neuroscience behind it, but I actually get to choose to stay in that moment or move. So if I choose to stay, then the outcomes I get in terms of not being fair to that team, that's my responsibility because I'm choosing to stay in that state, right? Just equally as if I have a team member that's choosing to stay in that state at some point, there's a T-junction and the conversation has to be had around, hey, we're supporting you in this way, but you're not taking any ownership around um, your uh, the way that you're showing up in your behaviours and et cetera, et cetera. And that's creating now a major um, stress point in our team. So there's there's two choices, there's two pathways, right? So you either stay or you move in that emotional mindset. So it's really clunky to start and it's like anything, right? It's a, it becomes When it becomes a ritual and you do it, the good thing is once you start becoming more aware, so today, even for everyone here who hasn't done any of that understanding or started this process or done any self-development work, things will start to come to surface for you. So you'll start to be more observationally aware. Ah, oh, right, so that's what Rebecca talked about. Now I'm seeing I'm doing some stuff. We see stuff through a different lens and we're starting to become aware of it. And so as we consciously become aware of it, because remember it's been sitting subconsciously, we consciously become aware of it, then we can start to make the change of the unlearn and the relearn. So yeah, it's it's really about getting to the point of ownership around ourselves and going, what's my trigger process? Where did it come from? Why is it here? How do I how do I get out of it? And that's the unlearn relearn piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, and that one, I suppose, um, um, when you were talking about um, when you were talking about sort of you know the what is the current culture in the in the organization? You know, when we say that you know um, uh, the boss doesn't like us or, or what's a, you know whatever, whatever. I think you, you've given three or four examples. So the question is. Um, from another point of view, when you say my boss doesn't like me, it's related more to emotion connected to me. Am I wrong, Rebecca? No, that's that's absolutely correct. So when I say my boss doesn't like me or any of those, that's highly personalized, right? So it's it's an emotional childlike thinking state. Mm -hmm. So it's like we talk about, we hear kids talking. So what is driving us at that point? Because actually if we sat in a logic, adult logic mindset, it doesn't matter whether our boss likes us or not, right? It really, it, it shouldn't actually mean anything at all. It's how do I engage and how do we work together collectively and collaboratively and use our innovative thinking and our diversity and inclusion and process all the stuff we did in one. Um, how do we actually work together and understand the thought processes of why I think, communicate, et cetera, and work on communicating more efficiently rather than sitting in a locked in thinking mindset of my boss doesn't like me. So yeah, my boss doesn't like me is highly emotive driven and it's very personalized. So remember the, I think the last slide here, this one here, um, which is this one, oh yeah, that one. Yeah, not real, perception, personal, highly personalized high and default thinking, that'll be a behavioural trigger that's going, I'm sitting in that space, which is that childlike thinking, right? He doesn't like me, I'm not, you know, in terms of any of that that um, default type thinking is in that, but we're actually finding evidence everywhere to prove that. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It is driven by emotion, it's personalised and it's a default thinking based on our past-based experiences. So we have to get out of that and come into that more depersonalized perspective. Go, how do I work differently with this person to ensure that um, I'm not attaching meaning to what it is he he or she thinks about me, 
I'm actually coming from it from how do we work more, you know, how do we make this partnership, I often do, if I have to do peer-based conversations, how do we make this partnership work better? You know, what are the things that we're tolerating with each other? What are the things that are working well? And, you know, what are the things that we can do differently and better? So it's a much more powerful conversation that hasn't got that personalised meaning. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, in term of okay, in terms of um, you know being sort of on an empty and the full um, and the full tank, um, and uh, basically you know uh, uh, going through it. Um, uh, I suppose as we all get busy and you know the, the the first thing probably we start neglecting is ourselves yes um, uh, what you what would your advice you know because we all have to prioritize we all have uh, you know important urgent stuff and uh, you know and I think that uh, you know many people will start dropping you know the sort of the the the, the self time or what they do for themselves to keep themselves energized, help and wealthy. Wealthy. That's what uh, sort of start. You know, start, gives in first. Yeah, totally right. And it's as. But here's the thing, right? If we're leaders of our teams in the organisation, then the message that we're sending when we do this is that remember you're the mirror <laughs> so what you do is what you see is what you get so what you're doing is you're saying it's okay for everyone else to do that yeah and we don't want to do that we have to become really disciplined and remember that slide around time-based value am I spending my time adding my value in the right places if we know and we do that categorically self-care is critical to ensuring um, good emotional health and well-being, decreased stress, increased productivity, capability, thinking, um, all of that stuff, then my question would be why would we not add the time in um, because that's a high value transaction that is hugely necessary and this is where organisations I think are starting, starting in terms of flexible ways of working to be able to enable people to, you know, go to the gyms, um, you know, go for that walk at lunchtime, set the context up so that it's not, you must be sitting at your desk between 7.35 and 6 p.m., yeah? Um, it really is around taking ownership from a self-care point because if you don't look after yourself, as I said, I think in the first one or the second one, the Mack truck will always come. So regardless of whether um, we're trying to go work is hugely important, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'd argue that what is the busy? So if we're so busy, then there's something that needs to be delegated, shifted, reprioritized so that self-care gets put in because you're the mirror in terms of what's there. And actually, if you're the point where you're burning out and you're in that space, um, you're not productive anyway. Right, so you'll be a deer in headlights and there'll just be a whole lot of confusion in the smoothie model, you'll be down the bottom and you know the organisation isn't getting the best from you anyway. So we need to be really, really focused, disciplined and consistent in maintaining self-care because that's the, that's the message you want to send out to your guys. So again, that mirror, you are, whatever you're doing is what you're seeing and getting screened back to you from your team. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the other thing I suppose you know different people will have uh, you know different uh, resilience levels and uh, you know uh, uh, myself personally I know I worked with some great people you know their resilience energy levels they were you know extremely high you know they could uh, they could do what many others you know just couldn't um, uh, not for that sustain it for for that long long time and you know, sometimes when you have people like that wanting others to mirror, it, it, it creates that it stretches people, uh, you know, because everybody, uh, exactly as you said, you know, 
you are not at your best if you are not uh, if you don't uh, spend enough time to make sure that your tank is full. So you know I'm finding that mirroring very very interesting uh, because you know it's also we are all different. We are all different, and you know what uh, uh, you know in terms of endurance um, as well. So so if you if you as a leader or you know if we as leaders can do it you know i don't think it's necessarily fair to impose the same to sort of you know to, to make a you know cookie cutter and yeah. expect to, to do it and this is where we have to understand our team right and so this is where we come all the way back to what drives those individuals what are their patterns what are their behaviors and, and how do I develop them at their level? So we do a whole lot of stuff around really understanding at an individual level, um, their development and self-care is part of that. And I agree with you, Billy. I mean, in terms of those leaders who are highly functioning um, and hugely resilient, um, they will, but they will crash as well. So it may be like me, right? So stay at the top and then go down to the bottom. So when you're in that space, that's a really good point. You actually have to have a temperature gauge across the organize, across your team to go, okay, so who are my barometers in that team and where am I seeing the gaps where I've pushed too hard, yeah? Or I need to back off. I need to look at the patterns. I, I promise if we start to use observational intelligence in terms of behaviors, the evidence is there and if we're, we're good leaders we'll be able to shift our own um, behaviour and, th and, and thinking in terms of getting what that team needs if that makes sense. Yeah yeah okay let's do quickly one more and I, I just love this one um, we didn't talk about it and I suppose it's a little bit um, it's a it's a um, it, it's really you know a, a expanding um, uh, these sessions uh, uh, how to uh, how resilient leader resolves conflict at work yeah <laughs> yeah that's another really big topic right so um, yeah, to resolve conflict at work, and I'm assuming that conflict, really, when we break it down, conflict generally comes from individuals, right? So generally, it's communication, and generally, it's um, a conflict is between between a group, a groups, people, um, etc. So um, again, um, what we have to do we've got to be really clear on what the conflict is so what I mean by that is often we move into a default listening mode when we're in conflict space so say we've got two people who are not uh, where there's conflict right so generally what's happened is these are the two people and um, both of them have become quite personalized because in order to have conflict it's become personalized right so we're in that real um, perception state and so what's happening is we've got this default listening trigger cycle going on so what needs to be dealt with is in the middle it never 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 gets dealt with right because we've got these two people who are armed <laughs> and ready and in combat style ready to create and continue to defend and protect or whatever it is in terms of our default thinking process and mind around uh, that conflict and so what we've got to do is we've got to almost come back and have a look at it from um, a, a diffusing thing and come back into come back into the patterns the behaviors because generally what it is is that the person self situation or environment has been the start of that trigger process and that has enabled people to become attached to meaning around what the other one is doing or thinking or saying and so we've got to almost step back and diffuse it and come from a more of a, a behavioral pattern um, in terms of again come back into what we're seeing and what we're doing and getting them present to their behaviors um, and the the um, the impact of that in the business and with themselves and then start to look at 
what are we trying to achieve and how do we do that differently? So we've got to almost strip back that default thinking and unlearn that pattern to relearn a new way. So there's quite a science. Um, I've got a whole lot of tools around Coach Communicate, which is how do I teach leaders to have much more impactful conversations where you've got to unpack what the issue is um, and almost diffuse it and go through a process that's quite structured that allows you to come out the end with a resolve that has both people feeling quite supported. Um, yeah, it's a really, really relevant topic and it's a big topic, but generally it's one that is, um, you know, we, there's so much stuff out there around um, how to have a difficult conversation. Well, who wants to have a difficult conversation, to be fair? No one, then it tends to be the stuff that we just leave. So if we come and go, how do I diffuse the conflict and have a much more connecting conversation once we get past the fear of the outcome of that and understand that we don't need to attach meaning to it anymore, then we can start the process of working together. So, I mean, I think that's another whole topic um, in terms of, um, you know, the processes to go through to do that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think you know uh, the the uh, attaching meaning to to it. It's um, it's something that uh, you know each each person will do differently, and yeah. uh, for different reasons. So so you know it's it's a it's a very complex uh, complex uh, a topic that um, I suppose needs to, you know some things probably just cannot be resolved but to create a conflict. Yeah, and sometimes we have conflicts within our job description and our roles and responsibilities, right? Because we've we've got two perspectives competing uh, on a similar thing, right? So we've got to look at the context as well. And so I think the biggest um the biggest tool, I guess, or tool, toolkit or biggest sort of strategy to put in the toolkit is to go, you know, often the organisation often creates some of this in terms of its team structure or the way that the world works is getting people present to what they're bringing to that conflict and that conversation that's creating the conflict. And whether that's done singularly and then together, it's about how that is facilitated because uh, it's you know not ideal to go in there and say hey look you know you're behaving like this and I see that you're doing this it's just that's just abdicating blame so we've got to come back to perspective and using slightly different languaging to actually get them present at an individual level and then together because often when we're in that conflict mode we're not seeing it we don't see the destruction necessarily apart from we go that boom I don't want to actually have anything to do with that particular personal group because they're doing that but on if we look strip it back it's the cost of it too yeah yeah okay uh, we still have a couple of questions but we will leave them because we are we are over the time already so um rebecca thank you so much again um i mean your work is just amazing i have been a follower of rebecca now for years and uh and um um Rebecca's work contributed a lot to who I am and what I am today. So thank you, Rebecca. I hope that everybody got the feel of, uh, you know, where where that can take them and, uh, you know, how much they can work and change, you know, their, their, their own circumstances by, you know, just sort of uh, uh, working on themselves. Um, thank you to all our attendees this evening for spending time with us. I hope you have found this um, beneficial. Uh, we much appreciate you giving us your time. Uh, on behalf of Nevik Qatar, we wish you and your families joyful and happy Eid Mubarak. Stay safe and uh, well and um, enjoy the festive season. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having me. <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure, Rebecca. Bye. Bye.